Welcome to Ancient Military History, a channel dedicated to providing visual representation of how ancient militaries operated and waged war, going into detail about the real tactics they used to win battles, and showing you, the viewer, how this would have looked in ancient times. In this video, we will be describing the tactics used in the Battle of the High Daspes that took place in 326 BC between the Macedonians led by Alexander the Great and the Punjabi dynasty of Puru, led by King Porus. By this time in Alexander's life, the 29-year-old commander had already conquered Persia, Tyre, and Egypt, and so his ambitions continued eastward. How much Alexander knew of India is uncertain, but he was anxious to press on further. In their initial march into the unknown territory, the Macedonian army was relatively unopposed until Alexander reached the Hydaspes River, where his military savvy would be tested in the face of a formidable adversary, the Punjabi King Porus, in an unforgiving climate, and lastly, a new and probably quite intimidating obstacle, the Indian War Elephant. In order to continue east, the Macedonians would have to subdue their new and powerful enemy. Marching into this battle, Alexander commanded a force of about 41,000 men, which was comprised of his superior companion cavalry, horse archers, and heavy infantry, who had perfected the phalanx formation. Porus possibly commanded a force of about 20 to 50,000 infantry, 2,000 cavalry, 300 chariots, and about 200 war elephants. The strength of the Indian army lied in its chariots, each of which were drawn by four horses and carried six men, two charioteers, two shield bearers, and two archers. His foot archers were equipped with long bows that were about two meters tall, which they rested upon the ground and, pressing against it with their left foot, discharged armor-piercing arrows. Lastly, he had a large number of elephants, a terrorizing and unstoppable force that could charge an enemy line and send it into disarray. Porus himself is said to have mounted an elephant, and being almost seven feet tall, historians described him as proportionately mounted as a horseman on his horse. While the Macedonians were protected with armor and shield and equipped with sarissas, or 13 to 20 foot long spears, the Indian infantry were lightly armored and fought with short swords, and their heavily armored elephants served as protection. The Macedonian army possibly saw elephants before at the Battle of Gagamela, but the Battle of the Hydaspes would be their first time facing this menacing foe in battle. In preparation to face the Macedonians, Porus stationed his men in a defensive position along the river and waited. Alexander made camp facing his opponent and across the Hydaspes, which was a mile wide, very deep, and fast moving. The Macedonians arrived in the spring, or the middle of monsoon season, which meant the river would be swelled up by heavy rains and snow melt from the Himalayas. So Porus's tactics were simple. Maintain a defensive position along the river, guard the best potential crossing spots, and slaughter Alexander's army as they emerged from the banks. However, he found out from his spies that Alexander intended to wait for the monsoon season to pass before fording the river, or at least, that's what Alexander wanted him to believe. Every night, Alexander split up his forces into numerous detachments, and he led his men along the bank in various directions, making a clamor and raising every kind of noise as if they were preparing to cross the river. Porus also marched along the river opposite the places where the clamor was heard, and Alexander thus got him into the habit of leading his men along opposite the noise. But as this happened frequently, Porus eventually concluded that this was only a diversion, and he stopped following the nightly clamors and battle cries. Assuming Alexander would remain on the opposite shore until the waters subsided, Porus maintained his defensive position, but he did place scouts along the river, just in case. Alexander continued this boisterous practice every night, because he was actually searching for places where the river might be crossed. Finally, one night, about 18 miles away from camp, Alexander found a bend in the river that was heavily wooded and suitable enough to cross. 
His men were readied for battle, and Alexander chose a violently stormy night to ford the Hydaspes River. As with every night, his men were divided up, and he left a sufficient force at the camp to keep Porus unaware of his crossing. In order to safely ford the swollen and raging waters of the Hydaspes, Alexander used 30 oar galleys and boats he had acquired when he crossed the Indus River earlier that year. Concealed by trees and clamoring thunder, they landed on an island in the middle of the river, and from there they waded across until they reached the opposite side. Porus's scouts noticed the Macedonians as they neared the shore, and they rode off to Porus as fast as they could to warn him of the impending attack. To buy enough time to assemble his men, Porus sent his son with about 2,000 cavalry and 120 chariots to slay the enemy who had not yet crossed and attack those who had already landed. But his attempts to delay were futile. As daylight approached, the wind and rain had calmed, and most of Alexander's army had already forded the river by the time Porus's son arrived. And he and his forces were slaughtered at the banks. Any chariots that attempted a retreat were slow in the clay-like mud and were subsequently captured. Only a few survivors managed to flee back to Porus to report what had happened. Porus thus searched for a terrain that had no clay, and there he assembled his men. He put his cavalry on the flanks and infantry in the center, with the chariots in front of the cavalry and the elephants in front of the infantry. He also left some men at the camp because he saw Alexander's remaining forces attempting to ford the river there. However, Alexander was not hasty to engage the Indians in battle as he wanted to ensure his men were rested enough and their strength returned. Then, when he surveyed the arrangement of the Indian forces, he assembled his heavy infantry in a phalanx in the center. Then he led the right-wing cavalry himself and he sent his left-wing cavalry on a wide flank behind a hill. The battle began, and Alexander marched forward, his companion cavalry with the horse archers. The phalanx was ordered to wait until the enemy's own cavalry and infantry were thrown into disarray. When Alexander's forces came within range, he launched the horse archers and threw the enemy into confusion with an incessant storm of arrows. Horus's own archers, whose longbows required firm footing as opposed to the wet and slippery ground they were on, were rendered ineffective. Porus thus sent forth his elephants, with his infantry marching behind. And Alexander sent forth first his skirmishers and then his heavy phalanx up against the elephant force. As the first line of Macedonians were either trampled to death or tossed into the air, the disciplined phalanx learned to subdue the beasts by hacking their feet with axes. The elephants, tired and in a state of panic, spread havoc among their own ranks and collided with friend and foe alike. With his center engaged, Porus ordered his right-wing cavalry to circle back and help his left flank against Alexander's charge. Then Alexander's own left-wing cavalry emerged from behind the hill and attacked the rear. This threw the Indian ranks into disarray, and they scattered and were driven into the elephants. Taking advantage of the chaos, Alexander and his men completely surrounded the Indians, elephants, horsemen, and all, and then he signaled his infantry to lock shields and move up in a solid mass. Most of the Indian cavalry and infantry were cut down and any who managed to escape met with Alexander's remaining forces who finally crossed the river, and the Indians were thus slaughtered in their retreat. Of the 50,000 or so Indians who marched into battle that day, about 12,000 were killed and 9,000 were captured. The Macedonians, however, only lost about 1,000 men. Porus himself suffered nine wounds, but he did not falter or attempt retreat. For as long as any Indian remained in battle, he continued to fight until he could no longer, due to his multiple injuries. Porus was ultimately captured and brought before Alexander, where he boldly confronted the Macedonian commander and infamously stated, Treat me, O Alexander, as befits a king. Alexander, having respect for the brave king, granted Porus rule over his own kingdom, but in return, he owed the Macedonians his allegiance. 
Then from the Hydaspes River, Alexander continued his campaign south towards the Indian Ocean. Eventually, after the annexation of the Punjab into the Macedonian Empire, Alexander did return home as his weary troops were exhausted from the continuous campaigning and they were concerned at the prospect of facing yet another gigantic Indian army. The Macedonians withdrew from India, leaving Porus in charge, and Alexander returned to Persia with the hopes of later restarting his expeditions. A dream that would unfortunately never come to fruition, as the Macedonian king tragically died in Babylon in 323 BC. Thank you for watching Ancient Military History, your go to resource for the strategies and tactics used by ancient militaries throughout history to conquer their foes. We are a brand new channel, and your support would mean the world to us. So, if you liked this video and would like to see more, please subscribe and leave in the comments which ancient military battle you'd like to see next. Until next time, thank you and have a wonderful day.